Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Shadow Fire Promotions Podcast, Front Row Ringside. My name is Greg Dennis. I am the president of Shadow Fire Promotions, your Chicago source for wrestling. We are, for those of us who are unfamiliar, we are a media distribution company specializing in mixed martial arts and pro wrestling. So if you're looking for that old footage of some of the classic UFC, you know, that old stuff with SEG Sports, the old Gracie fights, the old chemo fights, some of that stuff, you know, you might find a match or two on, on DVD pop-up, but you know you're not going to find the entire old card. Uh, you might go and uh, find some of that old WWF Coliseum video, all that kind of stuff. You come to us, we have it. We probably, if we don't have it, we can certainly most certainly find it. Anyway, onwards to the podcast. Uh, first off, I want to thank everyone who is listening to this. If you're sharing it, downloading it, streaming it, uh, whatever, it's much appreciated. As Steve Austin says in his podcast, hey, ain't no advertising budget up in this place. Ain't no advertisers, period. You know, at least he's got advertisers, so hey, we don't have any of that stuff. So if you're sharing it, if you're streaming it, if you're downloading it, you know, whatever, it's very much appreciated. There is no advertising, no advertising budget, nothing like that. So, hey, we can take anything that we get. It's very much appreciated. If you are a listener from, if you're, uh, if you're kind of a continuing listener, we've had about seven shows so far. We're trying to space them out, get them a little more frequent than we have in the past. Hey, thanks for sticking with us. I know there's a lot of loyalty over on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash SFP, like Shadowfire Promotions, INC Chicago. Uh, and I know that, uh, you know, we got our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash SFP, INC Chicago. See the pattern? So I know there's a lot of loyalty over there, so if you're one of those people that's listening, streaming, downloading from there, Hey, it's much appreciated. If you're someone who's never listened to this before, welcome. Hey, hope you stick around for a while. It's, it's, it's uh, much appreciated that you're here. We hope you stay around for a while. I hope you enjoy what you have. Anyway, upwards and onwards. You know, I was listening to a couple of things that I had downloaded over the weekend. First off, actually, let me go and back up a step. I hope everyone had a very safe and uh, happy Independence Day weekend. Hope you had a very uh, nice long weekend, didn't celebrate too hard, didn't wake up too hungover. Uh, but in any case, as always, remember the reason for the Independence Day holiday. Remember the veteran who gave you that independence from England, and remember the veteran throughout all your holidays. Um, so now onwards to the podcast, now for this time for real. Um... So I was listening to some uh, podcasts I had downloaded, not necessarily Steve Austin or Chris Jericho or some other, but some other stuff. And I was noticing that a lot of these podcasts really require the the people that do it. They need to have some sort of gimmick, like oh, they got to be like this this crazy guys, and it's got to be kind of a morning zoo, and you're gonna have these little fake names, like you know, you're you're. Uh, like you're some sort of uh, a radio show or something. And this really is, I was thinking about it over the weekend, and I'm kind of thinking, yeah, this is kind of like the Chris Candido podcast. There's really no gimmicks needed. You know, you're not going to have me doing all sort of crazy, wacky stuff. Eh, no sound effects, no crazy stuff. I mean, every, every once in a while I might go and play a snippet of music or a snippet of a promo or something, but... You know, you're not going to get all this crazy, wacky, eh, I'm going to play a character, eh. There's no characters, there's no silly names, there, there's nothing like that. You know, I'm hoping to entertain and enlighten you as best I can with with what I have to say. It's, it's probably, you know, very uh, informative, and, and, and a lot of stuff is open to discussion, and I hope that a lot of the people that listen to this actually go and, you know, drop us a line to our official podcast email address, which is podcast at SFP. Inc. Chicago. dot com, and say, hey, you know, I listened to your podcast. I have a question about something you talked about. I'd like to comment about something you talked about. Hey, that's terrific. Keep the dialogue going. 
You know, just like uh, just like on uh, our Facebook page, keep the dialogue going. That's the that's the way we do things here. That's the way we roll. You know, it's all about keeping the dialogue going. We like to keep it light. We like to keep it fun, and we like to kind of deal with uh, you know a nice little mix of vintage present day stuff, a little bit of merchandising, a little bit of marketing and promotions, a lot of stuff with independent wrestling. Um, but, uh, you know, overall we like to keep things kind of in a very interactive kind of format. We hope to have some guests coming on the show soon. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go on, um, probably closer towards the end of the show. But in the meantime... Let's go and go right into some of the current events I'm going to talk about. There's not a whole lot of current events you're going to hear on this podcast. It's mostly going to be current events that I feel are significant to either pro wrestling or the entertainment business, music, movies, television, that sort of thing. And I'm going to try and keep that sort of to a minimum because really it's not what we're about. You know, we're not about current events. This isn't something where we're going to try and recap. Okay, here's what the current events happened this week. That's not really what we're about. But uh, there, there are certain things that are definitely worth mentioning. And, um, you know, last week we had a very big sort of uh, depressing, if you will, uh, introduction with the losses of Chris Squire, of, of Yes, and Christopher Lee, and... We had Dusty Rhodes, and we had all these people that just recently had died. And unfortunately, death being inevitable, much like taxes, uh, taxes, not Texas, although I'm sure Texas is probably pretty inevitable too. And uh, if anyone that listens to this is from Texas, hey, is your home state inevitable? I'm just curious. I don't know. Uh, in any case, so we'll get the, the depressing stuff out of the way right away. Uh, it is being reported in the news that Jerry Weintraub, who is the head of United Artists, he's the uh, film producer, he's the chairman and CEO of United Artists, he has been reported dead of a heart attack uh, today, July 6th. And um, also recently passed, and, and probably something that flew under the radar a little bit for some people, uh, depending on how old you are, uh, someone who passed yesterday, and remember I kind of said that that we, I had mentioned earlier in, in a tweet and, and some other places that, hey, we're delaying it because some news kind of came in. I had no idea this would be what it was, but uh, Amanda Peterson, an actress who was probably most famous for the 87 comedy Can't Buy Me Love, she starred alongside a very young Patrick Dempsey, who would go on to play McDreamy in Grey's Anatomy, and she passed away on Sunday, and her family said she had some health issues, she had sleep apnea, and she had a, a chronic sinus condition and such like that, so... Uh, unfortunately, she passed away. She is only 43, so very, very young still. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, you know, that that was... Uh, she she was a, an 80s film and television star. She did a lot of stuff in her early 80s and uh, probably the late 70s, early 80s. And then she kind of disappeared from the entertainment business. And it's unfortunate that she resurfaced this way, so... Condolences to, of course, her family and the family of Jerry Weintraub. There, there certainly loss will be felt in the movie business. Anyway, on to our next topic. Let's get that all out of the way. So WWE is rumored to be putting out a new DVD on Owen Hart. They certainly have enough footage of Owen. Uh, he's been with the WWF pretty much since Stampede Wrestling closed down. And naturally, if you know anything about Owen Hart and the Hart family and the whole um, relationship, shall we say, between the Hart family, or at least uh, Owen's family and WWE, you know that Martha Hart, Owen's widow, is 100% against it. She'd be 1,000% against it if she could. I have no idea what's going to be on this DVD. 
needless to say, it will, without a doubt, probably be a puff piece. They're, not, they're certainly not going to go and trash Owen. It's not going to be anything like the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior or anything like that. Um, Bret Hart has come out in favor of this DVD, saying it's not fair to, to just kind of bury Owen's legacy. I agree. I know the sensitivity between the WWE and Martha Hart, because, I mean, the WWE, bottom line, the WWE was negligent in the stunt that cost Owen his life. So it's understandable that Martha Hart, you know, is going to be um, reluctant. It's probably not the right word. Um, adamant against it. Uh, uh, pretty cheesed off. Quite frankly, because, I mean, she lost her husband. You know, the bottom line is she lost her husband, and she didn't have to. You know, if they didn't, you know, it, it kind of reminds me a lot of the Twilight Zone movie when Vic Morrow was killed because, oh, they wanted the explosions bigger and badder, and the helicopter needed to be lower, and then the helicopter lost control and fell on Vic Morrow and killed him. It's kind of the same thing. You know, Martha Hart lost her husband. You can't really expect her to be, oh, it's okay, WWE. You know, I, I know you didn't mean to go and put my husband in a completely unsafe situation and, and make him feel like he was pressured to do this. So I understand that. But on the other hand, I do see Brett's point that, you know, all this footage shouldn't be just kind of buried in Owen's legacy within WWE and pro wrestling should just be kind of buried forever. So I'm a little torn. I understand completely Martha Hart's uh, uh, viewpoint about the whole thing because it makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. And, and I understand her wanting to do good uh, with the Owen Hart uh, uh, Foundation. I, I don't know off the top of my head what the foundation is called. That's probably my bad for not researching that before I started talking. But uh, in any case... It's completely understandable from both ends why both ends have the viewpoint that they do. And I certainly know, you know, Bret Hart has, is, is far from a shill for WWE, but, you know, he's forgiven WWE, probably hasn't forgotten. I don't know. I don't know the man personally, but, I, you know, um, he probably hasn't forgotten what happened, but I'm sure he's probably, well, I mean, it's pretty clear he's forgiven. I mean, you don't really have to have insider knowledge of, of Bret Hart's uh, mindset to say that he's forgiven them because he appears in their television product. So, and he accepted the Hall of Fame and, and everything like that. So, I mean, he's obviously forgiven them. Um, it'll be interesting to see. It's, it, I'm, I'm going to assume right now it's going to be a three-disc set because most everything they have is a three-disc set. Although, really, they've got enough footage of Owen to probably do about a 10-disc box set. Uh, because he's pretty much been there his entire career. And even even uh, his time before the WWF at that time, because Owen really wasn't around. Uh, Owen had, had died before they became WWE. So all of Owen's footage is going to be with the World Wrestling Federation name. Uh, but in any case... Virtually all of Owen's footage is any 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 wrestling footage that Owen Hart has belongs to WWE. Stampede Wrestling in Canada, his his dad's old promotion, belongs to WWE. Uh, anything that he may have done that was taped for World Championship Wrestling, WCW, is going to be a part of the WWE video library. So they've got all this footage. And WWE is certainly looking for a way to monetize it the best they can. So, yeah, put it on a set. And and from my perspective, taking out of the equation Owen and the way he died and, and who's to blame and all this stuff, it's smarter to go and make a DVD set of this than it is to put it on the WWE Network uh, because you're going to make more money off of it by putting it on a DVD set that people are going to go after, people are going to buy it, they're going to want to buy it, uh, that kind of thing, than putting it on a network where people are going to view it for free. 
you know, and then yes, okay, only the first month and nine 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 yeah, okay. The bottom line is they're not getting real money from the network if they were to air it. You know, the the notion of of putting out a DVD and, and I'm sh I don't know for certain. I haven't exactly looked at my local Best Buy, but I'm sure they're going to be putting out DVDs of, of the uh, events that were formerly pay-per-view that is now on the network because it makes the most sense to. It probably makes more sense now, more than ever, to put out events on DVD that are appearing on the network. So whatever, you know, Hell in a Cell and WrestleMania, all this stuff, it makes that much more sense to put it out on DVD because granted the bar is lower for revenue uh, on the WWE network than it would be on pay-per-view uh, due to the cable companies getting their cut first and then not uh, issuing, you know, not issuing profits or whatever for a couple of months after. Uh, so, but also as a, as a direct result of that, you know, that's what lowers the bar. You know, you don't have to worry about the cable companies kind of taking their cut of of your footage, of your show. So there's a much lower threshold for success that way. And that actually leads me right neatly into some, some questions on the WWE Network. Now, I mentioned in previous editions that apparently the WWE Network is going to continue to have every month free, or, or excuse me, not every month, but every first month free for new subscribers, which is fine. It's a great gimmick to get people to, to want to subscribe and hopefully continue sub to subscribe. So anyway, with the WWE Network, now that everything is on the network and uh, the bar is kind of lowered as far as the, the profit margin, as in they can make a profit sooner because they're not paying the cable companies their cut, I'm wondering, do they still have to have 12 and 13, we're going to still call them pay-per-views because there's really no other way to describe it, uh, do they really have to have 12 and 13 pay-per-views a year on the network? They're there, they're all there. The whole notion of adding all these pay-per-views to the calendar to continue to get revenue, uh, you know, for them, even before they were publicly traded. You know, first it was, okay, Turner's group, World Championship Wrestling, they made, you know, six a year, so WWE's going to do six. Then, you know, they're kind of fighting each other and, and uh, you know, trying to see how many pay-per-views they can squeeze in in a year. And and now it's to the point where we have a pay-per-view just about every two or three weeks. So you have 12 to 13 a year, if not more sometimes. And all these things are kind of squeezed in. And it's a common complaint uh, of fans that I've heard where they say there's too many. You don't allow a storyline time to build up because you only have two weeks to do it. And then there's no follow-up on these storylines because, hey, something happens to Wrestler X, and, well, we got to completely ignore what happened to him because, hey, we got to build up this next pay-per-view event that's happening in a week and a half, so we're going to forget everything that happened there because that was that was a week ago. That's old, man. Who cares about the old stuff? I mean, there, there's new stuff. I mean, hey, there's another pay-per-view coming in a week, man. That stuff that happened last week, old news. Yeah, sure, that guy suffered a career-ending crippling injury, but damn, that's old. We can't bother to follow up with that. I mean, his career-ending crippling injury, that was last pay-per-view. Let's focus on what's happening in this one. I mean, he's going to be perfectly all right to, to wrestle again in this pay-per-view because that's old stuff. That, that was a week ago. I mean, this, this is the future, man. Quit looking at the past. So, um, so I'm kind of, you know, and that seems to be WWE's mentality and it's been their mentality throughout the time. It's not something new. It's not something exclusive to the network where they just say, well, you know, here's what happened. Here's our storyline history, and, and, you know, here's where we go. They, they've always kind of seen to the notion of, well, let's forget the past. You know, back in the uh, early 80s, they wanted to forget the past of all the wrestlers that, that came to the Federation. You know, so when you came to W. Uh, at that time, WWF, 
you had a completely clean slate, you were pretty much a rookie, it didn't matter what work you did for what promotion beforehand, you were considered brand new to wrestling, and there is no uh, better example of that than poor Terry Taylor, who, as the Red Rooster was uh, portrayed as a completely novice, a guy off the street who was who was trained to wrestle and and everything, and despite the comments on an interview of Bruce Prichard saying, oh yeah, it's Vince's baby, the Red Rooster, and just embrace the gimmick, well, it's awful hard for a guy who's been a champion, who's, who's you know, wrestling for titles, who's considered a, a rising star, to simply say, you know what, I realize you're a professional and you've had 30 and 40 years of experience, but we want you to go and play a guy with no experience. We're going to push you as the biggest loser there could ever possibly be. And you'd be like, wait a minute, i got all this experience. I'm great, you know, I... I I've got titles. I've got, you know, a great resume to show. You know, you want me... It's kind of like, um... I would kind of, like, equate it to someone with an MBA, and they're going to say, okay, look, you know, I understand you've got an MBA and and, and all this experience and everything, but I really want... I, I really feel that this position, this, this doctorate position, it really isn't for you. I think a better position for you would be sitting here uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's, um... I think that's more suited to, to what you do and your skills and everything. You know, I just don't think you're skilled enough. So it's kind of an insult to Terry Taylor, and it's understandable why he thought it was a, a, a rib. Uh, but anyway, back to the original uh, thought. Um, you know, WB just really rushes through all their stories, and... and Everyone talks, oh, it's short attention span. No one no one wants to see a storyline drawn out over a long period of time anymore. But that's really only a part of it. The other part of it is is they have to continue to set up a pay-per-view virtually every two weeks. So now that they're not fighting with the cable networks for revenue from pay-per-view, can we maybe see them cut down on some of these pay-per-views and start seeing them develop a storyline a little more? Is, is that possible? Anyway, moving onwards with the notion of pay-per-view, we have WWE's Battleground pay-per-view in about two weeks, maybe a little over, maybe a little under. I don't know the exact date right off the top of my head. Um, but something I had talked about in last week's show, I spoke about how with the appearance of Kevin Owens on uh, WWE programming and how they, how WWE already seemed to be kind of blurring the line, I guess, between what was, you know, with, with mentioning what NXT is and everything on the regular programming, Raw and SmackDown and stuff, and it's not necessarily that I disagree with the notion of saying what NXT is, but NXT should remain a developmental program for wrestlers. You know, WWE used to work with Ohio Valley, and they worked with Heartland, and they had a, a Deep South and a, was it Florida Championship Wrestling and all this stuff. And they didn't want to work with any of these other independent promotions they wanted to have their own thing, which is fine. That's their prerogative, so whatever. Um, but now they seem to kind of want to, with the NXT belt being defended on at, at Battleground, it seems like WWE is already kind of, at least to me, it seems like WWE is already abandoning the, 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 the notion of NXT being a developmental program and it's just going to end up being another brand in WWE. You know, you had the ECW brand right among Raw and SmackDown. It was ECW, and it now kind of seems like they're going to have NXT be a third brand. And uh, as I mentioned last week, it's just a mistake. Keep NXT being what it is. There's the temptation, uh, and, and I'm sure it's been talked about before, but there's a temptation to turn NXT into this touring, full-time brand where, you know, it's right up there and equal with Raw and SmackDown. And 
whilst temptation, that temptation needs to be avoided, keep NXT to what it is. Keep it to a developmental place. Keep it to where guys who are coming off of injuries or guys who are trying to learn, uh, you know, WWE-style wrestling or whatever, let them stay in NXT and kind of develop their craft and get them ready and everything. Let, uh, you know, let that be the step above Performance Center. You know, let it be Performance Center, then NXT, then come to the big show. And if there's one thing to be said about, okay, you know, we're going to bring this guy up and kind of see how he works on one of the the, the uh, big shows, Raw or SmackDown. But to sit there and kind of already start blurring the line and merging it and saying, hey, NXT, don't worry about it. It's just another touring brand within WWE. Not a big deal. It's not really a training ground. It's just kind of another equal brand. That's all good and well, but WWE keeps doing that. They keep wanting to go and make more money for their stockholders at the expense of gutting their own program. Because right now, they're going to start gutting NXT and bringing up everyone from NXT, and then you're not going to have an NXT anymore. And then you're not, and, and a result of that is you're not going to have a place to train your guys because you're going to just turn NXT into this other, this other touring brand. And then, oh, gee, where do guys go? Do they just go straight from the Performance Center to Raw? I mean, if they wanted that, that's certainly their prerogative too. But there's got to be an in-between. Do you just, I mean, because the Performance Center is not something where it's not really like open to the public it's not a place where you get to you get to study your your footage and everything but you're not working in front of a crowd and every wrestler i've ever spoken to and and certainly wwe has said it oh the best way to kind of cut your teeth to see if you're what you're doing is right is it is working in front of a crowd there's nothing that beats working in front of a crowd so if you're going to sit there and gut NXT and say, well, it's just going to be another touring brand, you know, it's going to be a third brand, but it's going to be another brand, then then where's your developmental? Where's the thing where guys can go and kind of learn? Is, is that what NXT is going to be? Is that going to be for the newbies? Is it going to be like, because if you're trying to merge the, the, the brand NXT into Raw SmackDown, and it's no longer going to be this developmental brand where they have guys who are coming up or coming down or whatever, You there's going to be the pressure to make NXT function at the same type of level as Raw and SmackDown. So it seems to me that NXT is already kind of merging in. The, the seeds are kind of being laid for NXT to be Raw, then SmackDown, then NXT as this equal brand within WWE. So we'll see how that kind of unfolds. But I'm beginning to see the seeds being laid for that, and, and I personally think that's kind of a mistake because, you know, again, there's no, uh, there's no place for wrestlers to kind of cut their teeth, explore new gimmicks, whatever, because there's no step up. You go straight from the Performance Center straight up to NXT, and that's assuming that NXT is going to be this, this federation on equal footing uh, with Raw and SmackDown. But another thing about Battleground, well, not really Battleground. Um, this is just this is kind of a side note about it. Um, but there was an article I had read and the Christian Today magazine uh, was online. It was posted online. You can probably look it up yourself. And it had said that, that WWE Chairman Vince McMahon was unhappy with the Money in the Bank match. He said, oh, yes, this match was very unsafe. And, and you know, it didn't take the safety of the performance into account. Uh, he was unhappy with some of the spots in the match. He said the wrestlers could have risked injury. You know, this and that. And my first thought is, it's a ladder match. Wrestling is, in, uh, it, pro wrestling is inherently dangerous in and of itself because you have guys that can get hurt in the simplest of routines. You know, Steve Austin was almost crippled with a pile driver that was performed incorrectly. Uh, you may remember from the early part of the 90s when 
There was a preliminary talent, Charles Austin, who was crippled because he didn't take the rocker dropper properly. Um, there was the instant world chancellor wrestling or Vader power bomb, some preliminary talent, and and hurt him. So I mean, there's always going to be a risk of injury in pro wrestling, uh, but that injury risk is magnified once you start introducing stuff like ladders and tables and chairs and cages and all sorts of other things. And the notion that, that Vince McMahon is just so concerned about his talent is a little silly. And, and it has nothing to do with a uh, any sort of a bias against Vince McMahon or what he does, but it has to do with the basics of the matter. You put guys out there in ladder matches and cage matches and chairs and tables, ladders, chairs, and all this stuff, uh, uh, extreme rules and all this stuff, and then say, well, be really, really careful, okay? When you're sitting out there and hitting others with chairs and, and, and doing all this cage, be safe, okay? Well, if you wanted to be safe, you wouldn't put them in these stupid freaking matches. You put these guys in matches that are inherently dangerous, and the bar has already been set so incredibly high in the ten years previous with the Dudley boys and the Hardy boys and Edge and Christian. So so the fans, assuming that you still have fans that are, are you know, from the Attitude Era and have seen the tapes of the Hardy boys matches and, and tapes of the Dudleys and all this, you set the bar so impossibly high that the wrestlers kind of feel like they have to go and one-up that because everyone wants to go and be a show stealer, which is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being a show stealer and, or wanting to be a show stealer because that's the way to move up the card. But the notion of, well, this, this ladder match, I felt these guys took unnecessary risks. Well, it's a pretty unnecessary risk when you start introducing ladders and tables and chairs into a match. You know, um, d does anybody remember what happened to Joey Mercury several years back when he got smacked in the face with a ladder? Because he didn't get his hands up in time to block the ladder from smacking him in the face? Uh, Joey Mercury sure does, because if you, if any interview with him always kind of inevitably, at least at some point, goes and discusses that. I don't, you know, I'm assuming this, that he's clean now because he talks about, hey, you know, I'm no longer doing drugs and painkillers and stuff. But it's kind of something that you're going to remember, I would presume, you know. I mean, it's certainly not like, you know, PTSD or anything like that. But, you know, I'd be, if I was him, I'd be kind of a little squishy about ladders and, you know, TLC and that kind of thing because that can go way south way quick. So... You know, again, the notion, well, be safe when you're working these cage matches and extreme rules and, you know, use weapons. And, and I know that the announcers in WWE are kind of programmed by Vince McMahon to say, oh, it's so fun. Look at these guys. They're hitting each other in the face of the chair. Isn't that hysterical? Oh, there, there's toys, plunder. Ha, <laughs> ha. You know, I know they're kind of produced to say, ha, ha, it's funny. It's, it's cute. Look at them, you know, with all these weapons. Isn't that hysterical? But... You know, and, and they're, they're produced to say that because um, they're trying to avoid calling attention to the fact that it's kind of inherently dangerous. It's kind of an insult, in my opinion, to ignore the fact that this kind of a match is inherently dangerous. But, hey, what do I know? I'm just an idiot with a, you know, with a tape deck and uh, who, who watches the stuff, who watches movies all day, you know, wrestling videos all day. I think it's a little stupid, but whatever. You know, Vince McMahon has his own particular direction, and and we're all uh, fans in the end, and I'm sure we all have an opinion. Uh, and ultimately, it's Vince McMahon's company, so ultimately his opinion wins the day. But the notion of, you know, participate in extreme rules and cage matches and all this stuff, but be safe while you do it, it's a little like, huh? You know, if you really want to be safe, don't do it. You know, a, a, a pro wrestling match is inherently dangerous enough on the surface without adding in tables and ladders and chairs and cages and, and all sorts of other things. 
you know. I, I understand, and 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 that kind of remedies another complaint that was brought up on Facebook. Uh, Facebook.com slash SFP Inc. Chicago, SFP INC Chicago. If you are not on our Facebook page, hey, come and join it. Join in the discussion. Post something. A lot of guys do. Plenty of, of people join in the comments. But, um, you know, something else was kind of posted there was the fact that WB kind of raises the bar for what's entertainment, and then it's kind of expected that you're not going to get hurt, you're not going to get injured, and the notion of not getting hurt for all this stuff is a little ridiculous. You know, if you really want to not get hurt, then don't do it. Don't be introducing ladders. Don't be doing TLC, and 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 you know, as re with regard to TLC and extreme rules, and gee, I wonder where they got the notion of extreme rules from. That wouldn't have anything to do with extreme championship wrestling, which WWE kind of regularly disparages. Um, not as bad as, as as former world championship wrestling personnel and and Eric Bischoff in particular, uh, but you know they kind of disparage the ECW brand, but at the same time, they bring over all these ECW elements like tables, ladders, and chairs, and extreme rules and stuff. And Vince McMahon, especially nowadays, has a really bad habit of, you know, you've heard of the notion of milking something for all it's worth, and Vince McMahon definitely does that. I mean, he shoots it, he stabs it, he runs over with his truck, you know, he kills it, he decapitates it, he burns it. You know, uh, runs it over, or kills it again. You know, runs over it a couple more times, and then just to make sure it's dead, he's going to kill it all over again. You know, having all these gimmick matches all the time, whether it be elimination chamber, extreme rules, especially when you're having it, even if it's just once here, and you say, well, because today is Extreme Rules Month, every single match has got to be an Extreme Rules match. And damn it, because it's Extreme Rules Month, it doesn't matter if the storylines, you know, require Extreme Rules. We're going to make it Extreme Rules. So you're kind of shoehorning matches to fit the gimmick, whether or not they do or not. But, you know, that's, that's a symptom of a greater problem, which the greater problem is that you're really reaching for your matches to fit into this gimmick. And you're killing the gimmicks, and, you know, it's kind of a, a symptom of why pay-per-view buy rates were decreasing, because people have seen this thing. They get to see it so often that they're numb to it, you know. You talk about the violence of the ladder match and tables, ladders, and chairs and extreme rules. Well, it's because people have grown numb to it because it's, it's done so often. Any, any sort of specialness they might have had is, is pretty much done. So, I know that's not going to change with WWE because WWE has a really bad habit. And it's not just a WWE thing. It's, uh, WWE is certainly a major um, contributor, I guess, of this sort of thing. But they're not the first wrestling promotion ever, you know, milk a concept for all it's worth and so much more that it's run out of any sort of steam that it might have potentially had. Oh, let's see. Um, next, I'd like to talk a little about independent wrestling. Actually, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk... Uh, no, I actually will. I'll talk about independent wrestling next. So... Uh, with regard to independent wrestling, let me let me uh, quick take a minor detour uh, before I start about that uh, because I don't have it in my notes, but it's something that, that needs to be mentioned and probably should have been mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, we mentioned last show that uh, WB Hall of Fame member Black Jack Mulligan was not doing well. He had a heart attack and wasn't doing so well. But we're pleased to hear an unconfirmed report that Blackjack Mulligan is doing better, that that he has regained consciousness. He's still in critical condition, but at least he's regained consciousness. So that's a good thing. Anyway, back on to independent wrestling. So um, there's, there's a lot of talk about independent wrestling, and there's going to be a lot of talk about independent wrestling both on my Facebook page. There, there's going to be stuff in... Uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, pretty much everywhere else you go uh, with with me, our message board. Not just because we do a lot of work with independent wrestling, but 
but because when you get to see a lot of independent wrestling, you kind of get to see the best and the worst of wrestling. And the worst of wrestling is when you see stuff and you're kind of scratching your head and wondering, what prompted you to do this? Like, um, like what were you thinking? Um, like, how is this, this going to make you money? Kind of thing. That, that's when we talk about the worst. That's pretty much. That's pretty much what it is. That that's right there is like okay. I'm I'm curious to see how you think this is going to be a money making gimmick or whatever. And um, something else that that kind of struck me with independent wrestling when when I worked with them. I haven't been working directly in independent wrestling for a few years, um, but I mean, I'm always open to new opportunities in independent wrestling to use my skill with promotion and publicity and all this good stuff to help out local independent wrestling shows. So if you're an independent wrestling promoter, minor sidebar, if you're an independent wrestling promoter, um, if you are a... Um, mixed martial arts promoter, uh, you know, any of that stuff, and you want to have Shadow Fire Promotions appear at your event, you want to have us plug your event, all that stuff, please drop us a line at distribution at sfpincchicago.com. That is the email address you want to use for everything related to uh, distributing your merchandise. Um, but yeah, you see a lot of stuff, and the, the worst offender, when I first started out, it's gotten much better now, but the worst offender when I started out was with federations trying to go and copy uh, WWE. So when I started out in independent wrestling, uh, this was about 1998, 1999, everyone had to do the long-winded 20-minute promo to kind of uh, uh, start the show because that was what WWE did. You know, they had Stone Cold and, and, and Vince McMahon and the 50% owner and the 51% owner and that sort of thing. And uh, and I remember that really clearly. That was like kind of the first thing I was exposed to because the fans hated that stuff. It was always, you know, shut up and wrestle, shut up and wrestle. And I'm like, damn, you know, the crowd's pretty brutal. But unfortunately, that's the way it is. The worst thing to do in wrestling is to try and imitate WWE, WWF, WWE, whatever. Do not try and imitate these federations when you're on a fraction of their budget. I wouldn't even recommend imitating them if you have their budget. It's just, there's no point. Why would you want to imitate what's being done? People attend independent wrestling shows for an alternative to what they see on television. They're not coming to your show to see what's done on television, done on, you know, just the, the, the most minor fraction of, of their budget. If WB spends... And I don't know their budget for this stuff, so so I'm just throwing out numbers just for the sake of throwing out numbers. But if WB spends, let's say they spend one million dollars on each television taping, let's just say they spend a million dollars. I don't know what they spend. Don't care. Not relevant. But let's just say, for sake of argument, that they spend one million dollars on a television taping. So they spend one million dollars, and you're spending like what a thousand? What do you spend? Two thousand three. So you've got like barely a tenth. You don't even have a tenth of their budget, and you're trying to imitate what they have. And as much as imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, why are you trying to imitate? Are you that devoid of ideas? You say, well, I think a great idea would be to copy exactly what these guys do. Uh, does anyone remember what World Championship Wrestling used to do when they used to copy? Oh, we're going to watch WWE. Oh, that's what they're doing, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, you know, Ric Flair in his podcast mentioned the Ding Dongs because uh, at one time World Championship Wrestling said, well, the best way to compete with WWE is to copy everything they do. So let's find the stupidest gimmick we can possibly find. We'll put that on TV because that is the greatest way to compete with them. We're going to just copy exactly what they do. 
and federation after federation after federation has all have all died because they think that the best way to compete with the World Wrestling Federation or WWE or whatever is to copy every single thing they do. That's smart. I'm going to look at them and I'm going to copy it because people obviously, if, 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 if 5 million or 3 million or whatever people are watching WWE, well, hell, I should be able to draw on that money by copying them, right? That, that's a smart thing. People obviously want more. But I've said this multiple times. People go to independent wrestling to see an alternative. They don't want to see WWE done on a shoestring budget. If you're going to go and say, well, you know, for example, in Chicago here, let's say WWE is at the Rosemont Horizon, and you say, well, my indie show is going to be next week, so I've got a genius idea. I'm going to print up like a thousand flyers, and I'm going to go to the Rosemont Horizon. And everyone is there to see WWE. I'm going to flyer their cars up with my show. And I say to them, I've got a better idea. This will save you so much time. Just go and take all those flyers and throw them right in the trash can. Because that's where they're going to go. Because the people that watch WWE are not going to be, generally speaking, are not going to be the same audience as, as those people who are going to be interested in your show. I mean, I, it's, uh, wrestling, pro wrestling has a hard enough time finding a crossover audience. I was trying with NASCAR and and, and uh, was a roller jam for ECW and all this stuff. So if, if all these big league federations have hard enough time finding this crossover audience, what makes you think that you got the key to, to finding this crossover appeal that, that WWE and all these other big federations can't. And furthermore, on that topic, WWE has conditioned their most loyal fans for so many years that WWE is like God and everything else just sucks. You know, independent wrestling, that's for has-beens. That's for losers. If you're an indie wrestler, you suck. You're a nobody. Because if you were someone important, you'd be in WWE. Everyone else is just a loser. You know, and it doesn't matter if you're a Sean Devari, if you're a CM Punk, if you're a Hornswoggle. Hey, if you're an independent circuit, you're a loser. You're just a loser. You're no one important. Because if you're really important, you'd be in WWE. You know, and it doesn't matter whether you're an AJ Styles or someone else who's, you know, whether they're on the cusp of stardom or whether they're that guy who is just can't make it because he's considered undersized or something else, WWE has long conditioned their fans to believe that you're a nobody if you're not there. So to, to sit there and fly her up at a WWE event just seems kind of counterproductive based on the fact that probably less than 1% of those people are, are going to be coming to your show. If there was this massive crossover audience between independent wrestling and WWE, then every single independent federation that does this uh, uh, flyering of big events, that the WWE, whether it be you know the the Horizon here or you know whatever um, you know whatever other buildings there are, I don't know you know whatever. I don't, I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, the rest center in Green Bay or whatever. Um, if there was this great crossover, then you'd have that audience. But you don't. And the reason why is because it's not the same audience. I've got a friend of mine in Indianapolis who does promotions for, for a wrestling company. And I have to keep reminding him all the time of the same thing. Going to you know, the Hoosier Dome, or going to whatever other big arena the WWE appears in, and flyering that really isn't going to go and do a whole lot for you. You really have to kind of find your audience, and really, your audience for independent wrestling is generally going to fall into two categories. It's going to fall into people that are huge fans of independent wrestling in general, or it's going to be people that just, you know, enjoy a good show and are come with family enjoying kind of a night out so to speak, and uh, and want to want to catch a show.
you know, and they want to see the local guy and, and that type of thing, you know, friends, family, what have you, or just, you know, someone local, someone in the area that says, oh, wow, you know, local business, I'm going to support a local business, which is also a very cool thing, supporting local business. But, uh, yeah, I don't necessarily see where there's gobs and gobs of, of, of crossover between WWE fans and independent wrestling fans. So the next thing with independent wrestling that I want to talk about is merchandising. Merchandising and promotions, which is what I do. This should seem so basic, but a lot of independent promotions don't do it. They'll pay someone to go and film their show, and then they won't do anything with it. And then, and whoever films it ends up keeping the footage because no one ever asks him for it, and he just ends up having it, and they don't end up putting out a DVD. And when you're an independent promotion, getting your name out there is absolutely key. You don't have all this major cable channel clearance. You don't have pay-per-view. You don't have any of the stuff. You've got to do what you can to get your name out there somewhere. And the way to do it is put out a DVD, get a YouTube channel, have people go and recap your show, recap your own show. Uh, all this stuff, merchandising, uh, uh, programs and stuff. This stuff should be really, you know, kind of pro wrestling promotions 101, but it really surprises me that it's not, that so many wrestling companies don't do it. You know, and then they wonder why they never have any new fans. Why like the same people over and over, and then they end up, you know, either failing or just continuing to lose money. They just pump money into a product that has no shot whatsoever of making money. So this is this. It's really just it, it kind of blows my mind where someone will say, "Oh yeah, we don't have any money for our DVD." Well, you have enough money to pay someone to film it, right? pay that extra money because it only means yeah, I understand it's expense up front. I really do. It's an expense up front and a lot of promotions have trouble affording it. But if it comes down to spending that money and taking a chance that your promotion is going to get better noticed, by all means do it because things like uh, you know programs and DVDs and, and merchandise, something with the show on it that's the type of thing that, that's going to get other people to notice your show and get more people to pay for a ticket next time. And that kind of goes back to results. When you post your results, it just can't be. I know the temptation is there to keep it short and sweet and say, well, Joe beat Jim and Fred beat John. No one cares because there's no investment in these characters. No one knows who Joe and Jim are, so who cares that Joe beat Jim? Big deal. No one cares. They don't know who these guys are. There needs to be a reason for people to get emotional. Just like on wrestling on TV, there's absolutely no difference, or there shouldn't be a difference, between wrestling on television and independent wrestling in terms of how you present the product. You know, you have to get people engaged in the characters. And so doing, you know, Joe B. Jim, that's terrific. I don't care. I don't know these guys. Don't care the slightest. Give me a reason to care. Give me a reason to give a crap about any one of these guys that you are mentioning when you post your results. When I go and do stuff, I always make it a, a, a point to kind of play up the backstory and all that stuff because this is what you need to do. You have to build up something to get people interested in it. So, oh, gee, you know, this is kind of interesting. I, I kind of like this. You know, this, this might make me kind of take notice. If you're not doing that, then no one has any reason to care about you because you're in, unless somebody already knows about you or is just a fan of every single thing that wrestling has ever produced, it doesn't really make that much of a difference one way or the other. Um, with regard to merchandising, I know that everyone likes to put out black shirts because, you know, that's kind of the cool thing, the, the black t-shirt and all that, and I understand that. I do. I, I think a black t-shirt's kind of nice on a personal level, 
but on a professional level, I think that a lot of promotions should should consider. I'm not saying it's like a bad thing if you don't, uh, but I think you should consider making white T-shirts because hey, it's something that the fans can get an autograph on later on in the night. You know, the black T-shirts are cool and they're badass and all that stuff, but uh, you know, you you uh, if you aren't getting the wrestler autograph that shirt in the night. I'm not saying that you can't enjoy the shirt otherwise and, and all this and that, but it's kind of a cool memorabilia thing to have the shirt to get all the wrestlers autographing it. Same thing if you get any other piece of memorabilia from a show, whether it's an 8x10 to the wrestler or or a, a, the program, the program for the night, you know, whatever. Get stuff autographed. It's just kind of a cool memorabilia thing. You know, and if you're the type that, that doesn't mind wearing that type of thing around, hey, it might get some people to notice your show. And, and also, it gives the fans a closer connection with the wrestlers, which also is going to bring them back to the arena next month or whenever you hold your shows. And it has the potential to bring more. When you say, hey, man, these guys are these guys are cool, dude. You know, I went and had this T-shirt. They signed it. Look how cool this is. Oh, man, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I want to go to this show. You know, i got to get me something like that. That's going to be cool. Uh, and, and also, I mean, you never really know who's going to be your next big star. So it's, it's, it's always going to be a cool thing. You know, if someone said, oh, I'm making a black T-shirt, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a wrong decision. But I'm just saying that a white T-shirt is nice. Yeah, it's harder to care for. And, yeah, you can't really, you know, it, 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 it's easier to get dirty and, and, and look dingy and, you know, have to be careful with. But, it, again... It's something you can get signed, so it's kind of cool like that. Just, just a thought. Just throwing out something. Um, one other thing I noticed: it's not as prevalent now as it used to be. It used to be a lot worse about ten or fifteen years ago, where you set up the show the day of, not like the booker saying, "I have no idea what the heck I'm doing." but more of booking the, the angle of, well, you know, I'm so pissed at you because of whatever, you know, last week or last show, whatever, you did this. So this week, I'm demanding that you fight me in a main event tonight right here. We're going to give these fans a show. We're going to have the main event tonight. You and me in that ring tonight. Okay, you got it. The main event tonight is going to be this. Oh, wow, we just set up the main event for tonight. Wow, you didn't have a main event going in there? Did you just figure, hey, we'll figure out on the fly. Hey, you know what? Don't figure out the main event. Let's just hope that someone with a grudge comes out and, and sets it up for us. So don't set up that. You know, we'll set up some undercard matches, and we're going to hope that someone with a grudge comes out and, and sets up that main event for us. You know, that that's really what we're going to do. I mean, I, I've always hated that as a gimmick, where we're... Oh, we're going to meet tonight. Wait, wait, doesn't doesn't your booking committee have something to say about that? Are the wrestlers in charge? Do the wrestlers make all the matches? You know, I mentioned last week about my, my you know, beef, if you will, with the authority uh, gimmick that WWE likes to use where the evil corporate monster, the evil, uh, the evil empire, if you will, gets to go and put the screws into the local fan favorite and make sure to kick you when you're down and, you know, they're, they're puppy kickers and all this type of thing and they're going to do what's, you know, as WB lets, oh, this is best for business. It's best for business to screw you over and and how it's such a heat stealer and the notion of setting up your show and, and not setting up your main event and saying, well, we're just going to kind of wing in hopefully some guy with a grudge is going to come on and set the main event for us. To me, at least, and I don't know how anyone else feels, but to me, that's always been kind of a, it takes the sales out of believability because, it's like, okay, anyone can just kind of walk in and make a match. And and this is going back a ways, but I remember, you know, because I was on, uh, I was listening to Ric Flair's podcast, and he had Terry Funk on there, and they're talking about Wrestle War 89 in Memphis, and uh, or Nashville, rather. Anyway... I remember that, that they had talked about the angle with, with Rick going to the table and everything. 
and I remember the lead up to that because, and I remember that, you know, Terry was one of the judges at ringside, and and he said, oh champ, you know, I want to be one of the the first ones to congratulate you, and I also want to be one of the first ones to challenge you, and Rick said, hey, you went out in Hollywood rubbing elbows with Sylvester Stallone, I've been right here facing all these guys, I got a top ten. And you're not in that top ten. I don't have to face you. And I really loved the way that was kind of put together. I loved how that that was uh, because I really kind of thought uh, that was kind of cool. That that you know instead of like immediately saying you're on, you've got it, Terry. You know he's kind of like I don't have to face you. And then circumstances were such after Rick uh, had had been put through the table by Terry Funk. You know, the, the bookers in the NWA, the Crockett Territory, had said, okay, we have no choice now because of what happened to go and book Ric Flair versus Terry Funk. So I really liked how that ended up. And and I think that, you know, kind of sometimes, again, it takes kind of the wind out of the sails, in my opinion, to, to do something where, hey, we're not going to book a main event. We're just going to kind of hope someone with a grudge comes out and sets it up for us. You know, because it's like, okay, who's in charge? The wrestlers are in charge now? Um, anyway, so that, that's my personal little beef. Um, hopefully someone listens to this and says, gee, you know, I never really thought about it in that perspective because this is really kind of the point of the podcast and everything else, is to kind of express a different perspective, and maybe you agree with this perspective, or maybe you just haven't heard of this perspective, and you say, gee, you know, scratch, scratch, scratch. I haven't heard of it that put that way for that. That's, that's kind of cool. I never thought about it that way. Um, and, and, you know, something else with regard to footage I, I briefly mentioned, you know, tapes and DVDs and stuff before for independent shows. And the other thing that always really kind of got my goat was guys who are selfish with footage. When you have, and I've seen this before, where, you know, one guy has one part, another guy has another part, and neither guy is willing to budge, you know, oh, I've got camera one footage, and and this guy's got camera two footage, and this third guy's got all the sound, but, you know, I can't give my stuff to guy number four to, to assemble it because, damn it, I've got camera one and I'm going to selfishly cling to it. No one else can have my camera one footage. No, 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 i got to hold on to it. i got to. I've got to. I, I refuse. Okay, and this is one of the only times you'll ever hear me say this, so, so I'm going to give you half a second here. Get your recording device. You want to turn on, you know, whatever it is in your computer that you're listening to, and and uh, and record this. Listen right here. Ready? It's indie wrestling. Don't be a selfish bastard. Don't be a jerk. Don't sit there and say, "Well, I can't give up this footage to someone else to make the tapes." <laughs> Give it up. It's not like you're selling the rights to it. First off, it's not yours to begin with. It's whoever owns that federation. And if you're the owner, then you should be able to trust the person who's making the tapes for you. And third of all, if you're not making tapes to sell your stuff, why even bother having someone film it at all? Flush that money down the drain. Hell, give me the money. Make your checks out to Shadow Fire Promotions, Post Office Box 2746, Chicago, Illinois, 60690, and send me your checks. As long as you're going to throw away money, hell, throw it away to me. Like I said, I ain't got no advertising budget, man. Doing this show is two hours. i got to sit here in complete silence while I record. I ain't doing no work. No merchandise is being screened. You know, so heck, I might as well make some money off of this stuff. If you're going to throw money out of the drain, hell, give it to me. i got plenty of things I can do with it, believe me. You know, if you're going to be that way. But, I mean, the bottom line, joking aside, don't be a jerk. You know, if the footage belongs to you, then you should be able to trust the person who's going to assemble it to make the DVDs. If the footage isn't yours, it isn't yours. Give it up to someone, whomever the promoter says, to give it up to. But don't sit there and say, well, I've got camera one, and I'm going to hold on to it forever and ever, and I'm too selfish to give it up. You're a jerk is what you are. You know, like Steve Austin would probably say, you're an SOB. You know, Steve Austin would probably use some some stronger language. I'm on iTunes. I don't want this to be explicit content. I would 
I certainly have my own very colorful uh, Marine Corps language that I would like to use to describe someone who does that kind of a thing. But the bottom line is, don't be a jerk, don't be an idiot, don't be an a-hole, you know, make the DVDs, It's uh, make the videos, make whatever. It's in the best interest of effort and that promotion, and you're just being a selfish SOB if you're not doing it. Okay, so enough about that rant. I think I'm just about done with indie wrestling here tonight. So... We're gonna talk. I'm uh, gonna talk about Ric Flair and Ric Flair's podcast. In case you did not know, because I didn't know until about uh, a week ago when I was playing around on YouTube and I saw it. Um, Ric Flair has a podcast. Rick isn't the host. This isn't like a uh, uh, talk is Jericho or the Steve Lash show. Rick is the host. Um, he's got another guy who's kind of the host of it, and Rick is just kind of there for the interview and 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 just kind of. It's more of a discussion. Then it is like an interview. It's not like the Steve Austin show or, or Talk to Jericho or anything like that. I don't feel. I don't feel it's it's something where it's it's like a, an interview. It's more of a discussion between two old friends with the guy who's the moderator or the, the partner or the host or whatever kind of interjects and asks questions in between. But anyway, it's a good show. I liked it. There's only about seven episodes in probably just about as many episodes as I have. Uh, but it's good. I liked it. I really enjoyed it. But something that, that really, really interested me uh, was Lex Luger. Lex Luger was on there, and, and him and Rick talked about, you know, everything, from the horsemen to Sting to everything. And there's a lot of things. And actually, it's that one thing with Lex Luger that everything that I'm going to talk about regarding Rick's podcast has to do with. That's how, like, out of all seven episodes, this is the one thing that got me saying, ooh, let me write that down. I want to use that. I want to talk about that in, on my show. This is going to be, and this is a, a topic of some very contentious debate from a lot of people, but here you go. Which version of the Four Horsemen, in your mind, is the best? Let's see. We have the original group with only an Arn, Rick and Tully. We had Lex Luger. We had Barry Windham, Sid Vicious, Sting for about you know two weeks. Uh, Jeff Jarrett, uh, Dean Malenko, Steve McMichael, Chris Benoit. So, out of all these versions of Horsemen, which version or versions? If, if you have, you know, if you're kind of like, well, I like this version and that version, they're both kind of cool. Tell me which version you like the best. Or, again, you know, if there's more than one version, you say, I like, you know, this and that. Or, heck, rank them in order. Say, oh, this is, you know, my opinion, uh, the best version of the Four Horsemen to the worst. Here's my ranking. Send it all to me at podcast at SFP, like Shadowfire Promotions. S-F-P-I-N-C, Chicago.com. That's podcast at S-F-P, Inc, Chicago.com, like I-N-C, Chicago. So uh, send it to me at, SF, at uh, podcast at S-F-P, Inc, Chicago, and we can talk about that later on, about the lists of of uh, people, uh, the versions of horsemen. So uh, that's going to be kind of interesting. I'm, I'm very eager to see who emails me about that kind of a thing. Uh, something else that, that Lex had mentioned, he talked about the WWE Hall of Fame and who should be in it. He had asked, you know, if he was a Hall of Fame worthy career, if he would, you know, he, he honestly admitted he didn't think he would be ever called for the WWE Hall of Fame, but he felt that Sting should be in, and he kind of pondered whether Sting's contract with WWE, uh, required him to be in the Hall of Fame, or if that was a stipulation of Sting's contract. I haven't heard anything about that, so I can't comment. But again, this is one of those things. Email me at podcast at sfpinkchicago.com and tell me, do you think Lex Luger should be in the WWE Hall of Fame? Should Sting be in the WWE Hall of Fame? Both guys had some pretty, uh, pretty distinguished careers. They've both done a lot, so are these guys, but are these guys Hall of Fame worthy? WWE had some curious choices in the past for the Hall of Fame, and I know everyone's like, well, they have this person, and they should definitely have that person. So drop me a line, podcast at sfpinkchicago.com, and let me know your opinions. 
does Sting or Lex Luger belong in the Hall of Fame? Also, when Lex was on Rick's podcast, he had said that Rick was probably truly the first tweener. And I know this is something we talked about um, in one of our earlier podcasts. Got to be at least three or four uh, weeks back, so look on one of our earlier ones. In fact, why did I download all of them? Share the love, man. Seriously. Help a brother out. Um, anyway, he said that Rick was the first tweener. He said, you know, Rick was a heel and acted like a heel. And, and Rick has always stated that he prefers working heel. You know, he doesn't like working as a baby face. doesn't like working as a fan favorite. But Lex had said, yeah, Rick, you know, you're, you're really the first tweener. You know, your actions were that of a heel. But yet everyone cheered you like you were a baby face. And I remember uh, something today, I think it was, when I was listening to one of Steve Austin's podcasts, an older one, uh, where he had talked to Eric Young from T- uh, Total Nonstop Action, TNA. And they had, uh, him and Steve had talked about kind of walking that fine line of being a heel where you don't want to be so bad, you know, such such a badass kind of a guy uh, where you might get cheered by fans, you know, because they think, oh, wow, this guy's kind of cool. He's such a badass kind of a dude that that you get cheered by fans. But as a baby face, you can't be kind of too much of a of bland, vanilla kind of guy because, again the same reason you risk getting booed in favor of kind of a cool heel uh, kind of a thing. So, uh, it's very interesting. Do you you think that Rick is probably the first tweener? Do you think he's the first guy in wrestling to really straddle that line? Whether Rick is or not, all I can say about that is that I don't really think Rick um, acted like a tweener, like he wasn't trying to be like a Kevin Nash or, or a Scott Hall where they're doing you know, the surveys and all that type of thing that they did with the, the New World Order. Um, I don't think he, that Rick deliberately tried to elicit fan support, but I just think that Rick was just so good that he ended up having the fan support anyway, but I don't think it was kind of a deliberate thing where he's kind of deliberately doing things to get a cheer, even though he was supposed to be a rule breaker. But uh, share your opinion on it, podcast at sfpincchicago.com. Finally, um, something and something I was reading uh, 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 online about DVDs and TV series on DVDs, we're going to talk a little bit about the music business and, and the television business all at once because that's kind of a part of what I do as well. I, I you know, if I can find 30-year out-of-print wrestling stuff, I can certainly find, um, you know, regular mainstream shows. But anyway, um, I was reading this message board about the 70s television series WKRP in Cincinnati and, and how uh, people were complaining about the television rights to that show and how uh, people are complaining, oh, they don't have the rights to this this song and that song, and, you know, oh, that's, and, and it got me thinking of how the, the music industry kind of works, where, you know, they're saying, well, if you want to have our songs, you pay us this much money up front, and then you can put out the DVD, as opposed to kind of a royalty system where they say, hey... You know, if you sell this many DVDs, we'll we'll get X amount off of it. And how a lot of companies are like, hey, we just can't, you know. Well, a lot of times, you can't secure the rights to a song because there's no idea who the owners are because sometimes it's not the original artist who's the owner of it. You know, a lot of the old Creedence Clearwater Revival songs are not owned by the band. They're owned by the label. And sometimes if labels merge and go out of business, it's, it's difficult to find out who owns what, especially for, for older artists. But the question is, is it really selfish when uh, a music company says, no, you know, my price is too high or whatever for uh, 
a producer, you know, like whomever, to, to go and pick up the rights to your DVD, and you're saying, no, I refuse to give you the rights unless you pay me X amount of money, and then ultimately they decline and say, fine, we'll just replace with, with stock music, we'll do something generic, whatever. Um, is that being selfish on the part of the original music rights holder? Because on the one hand, you want, it's a business in the end and you want your money, but hey, here's a chance to get your music exposed to a, a brand new audience and you're being stubborn and selfish because you want more money and, and you can't agree to whatever. You know, there's, there's certainly a line between making money and not, and I understand it's a business in the end, but in the end, aren't you being a little selfish by saying, no, I absolutely refuse, you know, we can't compromise, there's just no way to compromise, yada, yada, yada. I think it's a little selfish because you have a chance to expose your music to people and, and you know, basically without being in that particular picture, greed is, is preventing you from exposing your stuff to, to a different audience. So I think it's a little selfish, but if you're in the music business and, and you understand, have a greater understanding than I do, or if you want to comment on it or anything, keep it clean, uh, make sure it makes sense, you know, don't be ranting about something that, that isn't going anywhere, but email me at podcast at sfpincchicago.com and let me know your thoughts on the whole thing. I know that in some places, the, a lot of original songs, especially for newer programs like the 80s and such, you can go to European distributors or Canadian distributors and get them with all the original music intact because music licensing rights differ from country to country. So a lot of times you can get them if you have region free, if you have international uh, uh, equipment, region free equipment, you can play region two DVDs or whatever. So for me it's a boom because I do have region free equipment and feel so, yeah, you know, easy for you, you deal and that type of stuff. But no, it really isn't that expensive. It's about the same price you would pay for a regular television set, a regular DVD player, a regular VCR. You know, it hooks up exactly the same way, same cables, hook it up. Um, so something something to consider if if you're you know a, a big fan and and um you know when I talk about merchandise we talk about uh, I know I talked about it last show I'm going to talk about it again how I have a a lot of stuff coming from someone in Australia big boxes you know 3 foot tall boxes just filled to the brim with DVDs from uh World Championship Wrestling and WWE and and Total Nonstop Action and all this stuff and and, uh, you know, if you have that region-free player, it's a great thing to have. You know, it's a great thing to uh, to go in and, and play stuff and see the differences. You know, I mentioned last show how in WWE, a lot of the time with their releases, they don't necessarily have to blur out that WWF Scratch logo. So it's kind of a cool thing. Um, in other merchandise, we've got, you know, I mentioned at the top of the show that there's all sorts of cool stuff that a lot of people don't know about. I certainly have a lot of independent wrestling stuff, a lot of federations that are defunct, no longer existing. Uh, there's always plenty of World Wrestling Federation, World Champion Wrestling merchandise. I've got a lot of cool stuff. I don't know if I have Facebook pictures of everything. I know um, I have Facebook pictures of some of the stuff, but I don't know what I have uh, because right now getting pictures of everything isn't necessarily tops on my on my list of things to do but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the cool stuff that we have i know i've got a, a hulk hogan backpack it's got a little it's kind of like a child's backpack but it's a kind of a cool thing just to have as far as a kind of a collector's item type of thing um i had mentioned earlier on when i talked about developmental territories i talked about the heartland wrestling association which is out of cincinnati and uh, they produced the Brian Pillman Memorial Show. Uh, and that came about shortly after Brian's passing. Uh, his widow, Melanie, had given him the rights to put the Memorial Show together. And it was a very important thing because it marked 
uh, the time when WW at the time WWF World Wrestling Federation and World Championship Wrestling personnel worked on the same show. They didn't work against each other with no interpromotional stuff. You're not going to see a, a WWF guy versus a WCW guy because that was still very taboo. But you will at least see them on the same card with a lot of independent talent, a lot of guys you've seen in Ring of Honor, Matt Stryker, some other guys, Chad Collier. Um, and, you know, so, so that's a five-tape set, five VHS. I know you're saying VHS, but hey, People in wrestling and mixed martial arts understand that not every single thing in wrestling, in mar mixed martial arts, has made it to DVD. There's a lot of stuff that never made it to DVD. Starting off with a, a good portion of World Champion Wrestling, like all of it, and a lot of the uh, other defunct promotions that didn't have a chance to get into the DVD era. So if you don't have a VCR and you're a wrestling fan or you're a mixed martial arts fan, if you don't have a VCR, you're missing out on something. You really, truly are. This isn't necessarily from my standpoint as, as someone who deals in this kind of thing, but you truly are missing out on something. There's a lot of cool stuff. Um, there's, there's the... Uh, five tapes set. It contains the highlights from the memorial show from 98 to 2000. That's two tapes. It contains the 2001 complete show, which is another two tapes. And it also contains the independent showcase, which is one tape. They're great tapes. I remember I was at a show um, in, in, a, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, and I had the NWA Midwest promoter, Ed Schumann, uh, who had said, hey, you know, what, what stuff do you have? So I gave the independent showcase to him. I said, this is something that, that the boys might like, and they just loved it. It was terrific, and it's a really good thing to see a lot of uh, good talent. Um, there's American Wrestling Association, a Vern Gagne's group. We talked about Vern's passing a, a show or two ago, and, um, you know, that's a, a really good tape right there. There's a couple of good tapes. I got Larry Zabisco and Super Clash in uh, Comiskey Park, which is a uh, new cellular field. Well, at the time, was old. Uh, okay, complicated. U.S. Cellular Field is new Comiskey Park. It was built across the street from old Comiskey Park, which is no longer. Old Comiskey Park is where Super Clash was held, at least this particular Super Clash that, that I have. Um, I mentioned before about World Championship Wrestling. Nothing from World Championship Wrestling was ever put on DVD. The only time you're going to see it, see the light of day, is going to be in compilation releases. And WWE can put out the best of Star Arcade or the best of the Clash of Champions or all this stuff. But that simply is going to be what it is. It's going to have their edits. You know, it's going to have the WWE logo, all that stuff. If you want to see the original without WWE logos, without any of that stuff, on the band to come to, because I'm the one that has it. Um, got a nice little AWA tape of Sergeant Slaughter. Very cool. Um, I mentioned before, there's plenty of total nonstop action. I've got some DVDs of Ring of Honor. Got a, a nice little collection there of that. Uh, Hulk Hogan Rock and Wrestling, another thing that never made it to DVD and probably never will. Um, plenty of UFC, lots of books, uh, great books, authors, you know, James Patterson and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, you know, music CDs, there's just all sorts of cool stuff. I got t-shirts from, from wrestlers, uh, especially if you're in the Midwest, you might know some of these guys, Chandler McClure. Uh, among others, uh, I've got uh, the Soul Shooters. I've got a ball cap from the National Wrestling Alliance, Wisconsin, NWA, Wisconsin. So lots of cool stuff, merchandising-wise here. Now, if you're interested in saying, hey, you know, I'm interested in what you got. Do you have a catalog? I do. Go and email me for a catalog at orders. O-R-D-E-R-S, orders, at sfpincchicago.com. Um, also, while we're talking about supporting my, uh, my business here, I want you to go and help kind of support some of my friends. 
we've got Kimberly Decker Cormican, and she's got a book, Whatever Makes You Blind. Um, you can get it on Kindle, get it on Amazon Kindle. There's also paperback. Go and search Amazon for it. It's called Whatever Makes You Blind. It's a really good book. I'm not going to tell you what it's about uh, because I don't want any preconceived notions. But trust me when I say this is a very good book. Uh, you know, I was all set to, to kind of pick up a copy, and I was going to be like, yeah, I'm just going to support Kim because Kim's a good friend of mine, and I'm not really expecting to like this. And I was just so pleasantly surprised at the book. I, I found myself, I was just unable to put it down. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I was really, really impressed with the book. And I told Kim, I said, your book is awesome. I love it. You know, it's, it's terrific. It really is. Um, let's see. Um, there's uh, some other friends of mine. We're going to talk about Cairo One. Uh, if you're in the greater Chicago area and you hurt, like the way I hurt, um, years of running and races and sleeping in the car, coming back from wrestling shows and, and, and doing wrestling angles and getting kind of just the everything crap beat out of me and, and all that stuff, uh, you know, I was really hurting really bad. And I went and I uh, saw an ad for uh, Cairo One Chiropractors at an expo for a racing event that I did. And I said, oh, you know, you guys can't fix me. It's just wear and tear, you know, all these years of abuse in my body. But, you know, they, they really made me feel good. You know, this isn't psychosomatic. I, I come back from marathons and I say, gee, you know, it used to be I couldn't sit down or stand up for a week after doing a marathon, but I really, really feel good. You know, I feel better than I did in a long time. So, um, and if you're still active in pro wrestling and mixed martial arts, you say, well, yeah, but, you know, they can't fix any of the damage that I'm doing because I'm going to go back out and fight again or wrestle again and get screwed up. They can always do a therapeutic adjustment. It'll just make you feel better, you know, when you go in. And as you know, if you're a wrestler or a fighter, hey, feeling good from the start, taking away some of those aches and pains, even temporarily, is always a, a huge plus. Um, going back to merchandise briefly, something I want to mention is the Cauliflower Alley Club. It's a benevolent fraternal organization of those involved in the wrestling business. They do great work for wrestlers. Uh, if you've heard of Don Marie's group Wrestlers Rescue, it's very similar to that, where the Cauliflower Alley Club, through their dues and through um, donations, helps wrestlers who are down in their luck and, and need some help. Uh, you know, Larry the Axe Hennig and Harley Race and these guys, Nick Bockwinkle, guys that aren't doing so well with accumulated years of abuse heaped on them from being in the ring. And it kind of helps them out with these guys that don't have any health insurance or anything else to get needed surgeries and such uh, to help them feel better. And we have a very limited edition Cauliflower Alley Club 50th anniversary in the Chuck Taylor high tops. These are some cool shoes. Uh, if you go to my Facebook page at facebook.com slash SFP Inc. Chicago, look in the folder, Cauliflower Alley Club. It's up there. They're really cool shoes. i got to set myself. I think they're pretty cool shoes. Uh, you know, and the, the, the best part about it is a portion of the money from these shoes goes right back to the Cauliflower Alley Club's benevolent fund so they can help other wrestlers. So you're not just helping me out, but you're also helping out other wrestlers. And, and what's better than doing something that, that helps you support wrestlers, right? Um, anyway, uh, some other people we want to go on to kind of give a shout-out to on this podcast. I'd like to give a shout-out to my buddies, the Wind Gypsies. The Wind Gypsies, they are a local uh, trio, power trio, cover band. Um, they are uh, some some really great guys. They're, they're great guys personally. They're a great band. Um, you know, they, they've toured the world. They've played all over the place. You've got, uh, you know, Nick Laramie on guitars, Ray Class bass, Neil Holmquist drums. Uh, you can see them at Wind Gypsies, that's G-Y-P-S-Y-S, windgypsies.com. They've got uh, some original music, a lot of covers. They're a really great group. You know, I've known these guys for, 
gosh, uh, four or five years now, and they're just really great. So, you know, if you want to go and buy their DVD, support them. They they tour all over Illinois, a lot of great places, especially northern Illinois. So if you're in northern Illinois, you're, you're much like to see them. But but they're really a great group, and you should really go and see them if you haven't. Uh, also, let's see. Oh, here's something that's really cool. Um, so we've talked about Roxy Astor and the Afterglow Fan Party. And if you're not familiar with what that is, hey, that's terrific. I'm here to talk to you about it. Um, the Afterglow Fan Party is created by Roxy Astor of Glow. And it kind of is, is because people are clamoring to her about hey, what happened with this glow girl? What happened with that one? You know, wh where is this girl? What's she doing? And so many people went and uh, talked about it that she said, oh, gee, you know, this would probably be a really good idea to try and use my connection with social media and everything and see if I can't get as many different glow girls as I can together and... Uh, you know, give give uh, give people that that uh, sort of insight onto what people are, what the glow girls are up to these days. It'd be really really cool. And what she's doing is she organized the Afterglow Fan Party, and what it is is it's ex almost exactly what it sounds like. It's uh. It's a chance for the fans to get together with the glow girls in, in, in a nice little intimate environment. You know, we're not talking about filling up uh, uh, the, the old Pontiac Silver Dome or anything like that. But it's a chance for the fans to get up close and intimate and ask questions of the glow girls and hear some great stories and just everything. And it's a real intimate, you know, Q&A kind of a thing. And it's truly is uncensored because, you know, some of the stories that the girls are going to tell... It are just really they'll, they'll kind of make your hair stand up, uh, but it's great. It's uncensored. You know, nothing is off limits. It's just hey, go with the flow. It's a really cool thing. The first Afterglow fan party is on DVD. Roxy is selling them, and what's even more cool about that is that Roxy is individually autographing these things. So. It's not like you have some replica signature or they're mass-produced or stamped or whatever. No. Roxy is signing each and every DVD that is sold. You will have to say, hey, you know, I'm your biggest fan, love Roxy Astor. That's fine. She will autograph it any way you please. Just let me know when you order the DVD, and this stuff will come straight from Roxy, okay? So when you order these things, hey... They come, you know, you send us the, the, the money, you send us the payment, and these things order straight from Roxy. She signs it, sends straight to you. You're not going to see her home address. Sorry, guys. She's taken anyway. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, but so, so you got the DVD, which is very, very cool. But even more importantly, Roxy has done kind of the next step to the Afterglow fan party. I think this is really cool. I'm going to try and talk to my girlfriend and see if she's interested in this kind of thing because this is, is really cool. The Afterglow fan party, I would say it's going on the road, but that's kind of a misnomer. It's not going on the road. It's going on the sea. The, the Afterglow fan party is going on the sea. You're going to go with the Afterglow fan party and you're going to go on Carnival Cruise Lines with ten glow girls. So Roxy Astor, you've got Lightning, you've got, uh, I believe, Hollywood, uh, you've got Tulsa, MTV, Melody Trouble Vixen. So you're going to have ten glow girls with, you know, you on a Carnival Cruise Line. And this is the Afterglow fan party, so you know anything goes. You go and have a chance to talk to them and ask questions and get autographs and just all sorts of really cool stuff. Uh, it's a four-night trip. You're going from Long Beach to Baja, Mexico. Uh, you're going to visit Catalina and, and, and uh, excuse me, Ensenada. You've got all these uh, great staterooms you can be in. 
and uh, you got the schedule and 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 uh, everything with with the Carnival Cruise Lines. It's really cool, in my opinion. Like I say, hey, it's in California. I'm in Chicago, but you can bet your bottom dollar I'm gonna try and get my fanny out there to to Cali if I can, because this sounds really really cool, and and hopefully this is gonna be filmed too, and and Roxy can go and do the film work with this because this sounds really cool. Um, it's a four-night trip. It starts on Sunday, May 22nd. So that means it goes from May 22nd to uh, May 26th. So it's a Sunday through a Thursday. Um, it leaves Long Beach at uh, 5.30 on May 22nd. This is obviously 2016. So you get some time to save up. But if you're interested in doing this, head out to GoSeeTravel.com, S-E-A, GoSeeTravel.com, slash, um, slash R-W, slash cruise, slash 5222, and that's all the information about all the staterooms and the cruise and where you're going to be and everything. I don't have a complete list of all the Glow Girls yet. But if you give me time, maybe by next week, I'll have it. Uh, kind of clicking forth and uh, seeing what we have. I don't know if I have everything. No, I don't. Okay. So I don't have a complete list, but I know there's going to be 10 Glow Girls. So, hey, shoot me a line, podcast at sfpincchicago.com. And, hey, maybe next week I can have a list of all the Glow Girls. It should be pretty cool. Um... Also, another good friend of mine, Daniel Pewter, you might remember him. He is the undefeated mixed martial arts fighter, undefeated pro wrestler. Uh, he was the first and only uh, $1 million tough enough winner. No, he's, he's the first. I don't think he's the only. Uh, but he is the first $1 million tough enough winner. Uh, he is the person who kind of uh, got Kurt Angle in um, a little bit of a sticky situation when Kurt had his open challenge because Pewter was actually a very skilled mixed martial artist. So when he went on his back, uh, he was able to take Kurt's back and almost shattered Kurt's arm until the referee very wisely went and stopped the match and, and, and counted down Pewter's shoulders down because Dan Pewter, obviously, as a mixed martial artist, you don't worry about being flat in your back. You don't worry about that kind of a thing. Uh, but Daniel Pewter is now working with a charity group that, that he runs. It's called My Life, My Power. And it's an anti-bullying charity. And he works with a lot of uh, youth, you know, high school kids and that. And it's called MyLifeMyPower.org. It's a very cool group. You should check it out. Daniel just returned to the ring. So he captured the My Life, My Power Tag Team Championship. But, uh, you know, if you get a chance, check it out. You know, if you think uh, that you'd like to host one of his charity pro wrestling shows, drop him a line. Drop me a line. You know, I know that Dan's got uh, his contact information on the website, but you can drop him a line. He can he can certainly tell you what he needs. You can drop me a line at podcastsfpinkchicago.com. You can put Dan a pewter in the subject and say, hey, how do I get in touch with Dan? How do I how do I go and say you know that I want to appear. At, at, I want his his uh, charity pro wrestling show to appear at my local high school, or you know he does also work a lot of work with the military. If you're active duty, if you're reserve or whatever, and you say, hey, this would be great entertainment for where I'm at. So hey, you know, same thing. Drop me a line. Let me know. Say hey, you know, I'm in the military. How do I get Dan to appear on the military base where I am? Well, drop me a line. Drop Dan a line. You know, either or. Uh, you can drop me a line at podcastsfpinkchicago.com. You can go to mylifemypower.org, and you can email Dan from there. In any case, um, you know, either or, all works just the same. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some more news about Dan Pewter coming up in... Uh, a couple of weeks. We will be having guests. I know we talked about it. I'm going to do a couple more shows just kind of solo, just to kind of establish things while I'm in iTunes. But we 
do have an interest in bringing guests aboard. We will be having guests very, very soon. It's going to be a very, very cool thing to have some guests. I'm not going to tell you right now who the guests are, but I will tell you that they are some friends of mine, and we are going to be looking to be booking more guests in the near future. So if you are interested in that, if you're a wrestler, if you're a fighter, Drop me a line at podcast at sfpinkchicago.com and let me know and say, hey, I'd like to appear on Front Row Ringside. I would love to have you. I'd love to talk to you about your career and everything involving mixed martial arts or pro wrestling or both, as the case may be. Um, you can find us. You can find the Shadow Fire Promotions podcast in iTunes. Just look up Shadow Fire Promotions. Um, you'll find us on iTunes, you'll find us on YouTube, you'll find some video clips from either our partners, or you can find the podcast there streaming at uh, youtube.com slash Chicago. You can also find us on Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O, Vimeo.com slash Chicago. Um, you can find us in Daily Motion. DailyMotion.com slash Chicago. You can find Shadowfire Promotions on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Chicago. Twitter, Twitter.com slash Chicago. Um, seeing the pattern here? I hope so. <laughs> um, I think that's about all the links. Let me, uh, uh, I'm sure there's probably some others. We're on Pinterest. We, we don't have anything set up there yet, but we, we do have a Pinterest thing, so I'm not really going to plug it yet because there's no uh, images there. You can come and visit our website. It's still in progress. There's just a lot of merchandise to load and new stuff coming in all the time, so it's really difficult to kind of get caught up with all that, but we're working hard for a 2016 unveiling of that full site with shopping cart and everything, and that is sfpinkchicago.com. Uh, some other people to check out. If you like burgers and you like beer, you can check out my buddies at Universal Soul. They're having their burgers and beer annual fun run. It's 5K, and for those of you who are not metric friendly, that's about three miles. And at the end, you get burgers. And wait for it, wait for it. Beer! Hey, sounds great. You run three miles, you get burgers and beer, you get to socialize. It's a really cool thing. Uh, I've, I've been working burgers and beer, I think, almost since the inception of that race. It's, it's a really great race, and Universal Soul is one of Chicago's premier running stores for running gear. It's, uh, it's a great place, great people, you know, everything in Chicago. You can check it out at Universal Soul. S-O-L-E, like, you know, sole your shoe because it's a running store, right? Universalsoul.com. And uh, make sure you mention, you know, my name, Shadow Fire Promotions. Make sure, you know, Greg Dennis, whatever you want to do. Either way, just drop them a line let them know, hey, you know what? I'm coming to you from here. They'd like to know. I don't get a dime off of it. I'm just hooking a brother up. In any case, so, uh, we're closing in on the two-hour mark, so I think now is a perfect time to go and kind of sail off into the sunset, the moonlight, the sunrise, depending on what hour of the day you're listening to this and the hour of the day that I'm recording it. But uh, in any case, um, as Steve Austin might say, it'll, it'll catch your butt down a road, catch you down a road. And uh, again, I want to thank you all for listening, for streaming, for downloading. Thank you for being there. I would really appreciate it if you shared and tell all your friends and everything. And until next week's show, I'll see you guys front row ringside.